Good afternoon. I'm Eve Stern, Director of URI Center for the Humanities, and I'd like to welcome you to the first talk in URI's Long Road to the Vote, Suffrage Centennial Lecture Series. In 2020, we celebrate two monumental events in American history, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, granting American women the right to vote, and the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which at least nominally enfranchised African-American men. To mark the occasion, URI has planned a year-long virtual series that explores suffrage, history, and modern-day voting issues. Today, questions surrounding access to the vote are prominent in the public square as we debate issues ranging from mail-in ballots to felon disenfranchisement. At this time, it's more critical than ever to explore the long road to how Americans won access to the vote and the legacy of their struggles. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to thank the Suffrage Centennial Committee, a dedicated team of historians, women's studies scholars, and administrators who planned this series, and to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for the Humanities, Gender and Women's Studies Program, Honors Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Women's Leadership Council for making it possible. I'd also like to thank Joanne Esposito from URI Events for assembling an amazing team that helped us publicize and launch our series. This afternoon, I'm delighted to announce our first speaker, Professor Kenneth Flory, to speak about suffrage memorabilia and the marketing of the movement. Professor Flory is a retired professor of English at Southern Connecticut State University and one of the foremost collectors of women's suffrage memorabilia in the US. For the past 35 years, he's been an avid collector of such memorabilia as postcards, buttons, sheet music, posters, ceramics, advertising cards, ribbons, and sashes like the one I'm proudly modeling for you this afternoon. He's published two books about his unique collection titled Women's Suffrage Memorabilia and American Women's Suffrage Postcards. Recognized as one of the nation's leading experts on suffrage memorabilia, Professor Flory is sought after as a consultant and speaker and contributor to museum displays and antiques publications. He also serves as vice president of both the Ephemera Society of America and the American Political Items Collectors. We are thrilled to welcome Professor Flory to URI this afternoon. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. I didn't know I did all that stuff. You must be making a bit of it up at any rate. Uh, my original title for this presentation was Women's Suffrage Memorabilia with Rhode Island Connections. Unfortunately, I don't think that there's too much sexy uh, memorabilia that was produced in Rhode Island. There's a couple of things, and I will get into that. Uh, I'd like to kind of begin, though, this discussion by answering a question that uh, Don, who does public affairs here at uh, University of uh, Rhode Island, asked me and about, and she said, when this material was originally produced, were the women conscious of the fact that they were dealing with historical memorabilia, or was this just something of a, of a passing, uh, passing fantasy? And it's a complicated question, and it's a question that I'm not sure that I have enough time to deal with uh, today. But I will say that there were women collectors at the time who seriously, seriously, seriously took the topic of memorabilia onto, I think, a fairly uh, sophisticated uh, high, high level. Uh, they collected it, they wrote about it. Uh, one can go through suffrage journals and find references to buttons, to postcards, to what have you. Not only references, but features. Uh, some of the journals, for example, if, uh, if a postcard came out, would actually highlight that postcard on the front page. The first slide that I would like to show you, the story of a sub-pioneer by Sarah M. Algio. This does have impact or resonance for Rhode Island people. Uh, Algio was a Rhode Island suffragist. And her 
book about her experiences and about the suffrage movement in Rhode Island, the story of a sub pioneer. It's taken from uh, a book by Anna Howard Shaw, who was one of the uh, foremost suffrage leaders in this country. Uh, and her uh, book was The Story of a Pioneer. What this particular book is famous for is not so much Algio's account of the suffrage movement in Rhode Island, but for a picture that she has towards the end of her book. And I don't know how much detail you can see here, but this is the famous Alice Park collection of suffrage memorabilia, suffrage buttons. Alice Park was an activist in California who in 1911 was one of the women who was instrumental in getting California on the ballot. Uh, she collected buttons, but she also produced postcards. This button collection, when collectors first saw it, were just amazed and drooled. And how can you uh, put together a collection like this in pre-internet, pre-auction days, pre-catalog days? Uh, yes, there are more buttons. I mean, she is missing some buttons, but I think uh, the average suffrage collector today would be more than pleased to simply have this as a collection and trade it for what they have. Uh, the collection consists of both English and American buttons, which is an indication of how international the movement was. Suffragists in America and England, they traded ideas back and forth. Uh, some of the uh, American suffrage leaders went to England and learned about the movement there. Some of the English people came, to, such as uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, came to the United States on several occasions uh, to talk and, and to raise money for uh, the movement back home. You can't really see it up close, but there are no anti-suffrage buttons pictured here. And I wondered about that until I found out later that, yes, she did collect anti-suffrage buttons also, but she pinned them on the back of this cloth because she did not want the anti-suffrage uh, memorabilia to sully uh, what she had put together. But any, at any rate, this is just, as, as I said, a wonderful collection. All right, now the, I am starting off with English buttons for a couple of reasons, a variety of reasons. Memorabilia. The women's movement, as you know, started in Seneca Falls in 1848. But it took a long time for the original suffrage movement to evolve into the suffrage movement that you see in movies and pictures and photographs, the 20th century movement. Uh, and the 20th century movement uh, was much more interested in memorabilia for a variety of reasons. A couple of things that I like to talk about here is this and the evolution of memorabilia in the 20th century. Margaret Finnegan wrote a book called The Sell Selling Suffrage. And selling suffrage was basically a discussion of how the activists were able to take the emerging consumer culture in the United States and employ it to their own usage. In other words, they knew how to advertise the movement. In the 19th century, there was memorabilia, but most of the memorabilia that survives, a couple pieces of sheet music, certainly some uh, posters, advertising, uh, lectures, and pamphlets. But the kind of apparel that we associate with memorabilia today just was not there uh, for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is uh, simply because of modern technology. Buttons, the kind of celluloid buttons that most of you are familiar with, we don't use them as much today as we used to, but celluloid buttons were not patented in the United States until 1876. Uh, they were used mainly in the beginning for political campaigns. The suffragists were among the first to use the celluloid button for reasons other than uh, a, a political campaign. So that was one thing, uh, uh, emerging technology. In postcards, 
postcards, the technology was always there for postcards from a, a very early date. But one of the problems with postcards was postal regulations, which I won't bother to get into, but which changed towards the end of the 19th century. When those postal regulations changed, postcards exploded, and I really mean exploded throughout the world. Uh, in England, they estimate uh, up until about 1920 that several billion postcards were produced. Now, you know, how, how do they know this? Well, they know this simply because of sales of penny postage stamps. The postage for letters was higher than the postage for uh, postcards. And that just by counting up the number of, uh, of a penny uh, stamps that were sold, you knew approximately how many of, of, of postcards were, were produced in England. Uh, both the uh, suffragists and commercial enterprises got into the postcard uh, movement. The, uh, uh, there were actually postcard shops in most major cities where the only thing they uh, sold were postcards, but we'll be getting into that uh, uh, a little bit more. So we have the commercial aspect. We have something called uh, visual rhetoric. And this is a term that it's applied to some of the things that Alice Paul did. In other words, how do you promote the movement? Well, you know, beyond the, you know, the simple pamphleteering with, uh, and, and the speech making, you do things that attracted a, a, a visual display. Your marches, for example. And, you know, the bigger the march, the more colorful the, uh, the march, the more of an impact, I think, that the movement had on the average person. You did things like you picketed the White House, and that, again, was a visual, uh, visual display. Uh, there, there were other things that they did. Uh, and uh, so the technology, uh, visual rhetoric, the consumer culture, all helped to uh, uh, produce uh, memorabilia. Now, the reason why I'm starting off with English buttons is that the English were maybe about a year behind America in terms of producing buttons. But I think the English did a lot of things that the Americans since modeled. Any of you who are at all aware of the suffrage movement know that the traditional iconic uh, phrase was votes for women. And votes for women, although it's ubiquitous in the United States, was not, was not an American invention. It came from England in 1905. And what happened was that at, at that time, the Liberal Party seemed about ready to take over after 25 years of conservative leadership. And the suffragists were really, really eager to press the Liberal Party on what they would do to help women attain the vote. So at a meeting in 1905 of the Liberal Party, women came in, suffragists came in, they, they had hoped to occupy the first row of the balcony. And they uh, were hoping to unfurl a gigantic banner that said, uh, Liberal Party, what are you going to do to help vote for women? Well, instead of being given the entire top row, they were given two seats. And, you know, uh, the women had counted on, you know, uh, unfurling this banner uh, across the back, which they couldn't do. So somebody had a scissors, so they clipped it down to votes for women. And so you know, the, uh, the two women who were permitted there could hold it up, and they did, and that became history. So in, in, in other words, it's probably good that they didn't have enough seats. The merchandising genius in England for memorabilia was a man called Frederick Pepic Lawrence. And he and his wife were members of the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, which turned out to be the militant uh, force in England uh, behind suffrage. It's the WSPU that engaged in things such as uh, firebombing mailboxes. They threw stones attempting to break the windows at uh, the prime minister's residence. They actually 
set fire to and destroyed several churches. Their justification was, well, they were really concerned for human life, and before they burned down a building, one of the things they wanted to make sure is that nobody was inside. And luckily, nobody uh, was. But Frederick uh, Pepic Lawrence, among the other things that he did, was to start up something called the Woman's Press, which was not an actual entity that uh, the WSPU owned, but he simply produced a lot of the memorabilia. Uh, it included buttons, included postcards, it included tea sets, included tea, it included Christmas gifts, it included all kinds of three-dimensional kinds of objects. Very successful. They advertised uh, these products in the their, their journal, their official journal, Votes for Women, and uh, they also opened up a series of shops throughout London. And at one time, I think they had uh, 17 shops where they did nothing but sell memorabilia, although there was a space set aside where women could come in and talk with uh, one another, talk about suffrage, uh, uh, and just engage socially. The WSPU, his wife, uh, Emmeline, Emmeline uh, Pepic Lawrence, was the one who came up with a color combination, official colors, purple, green, and white. And she was so successful with the colors that people recognized them as suffrage colors without any specific reference to the suffrage movement. Uh, after a famous uh, uh, rally at Hyde Park, newspapers were filled with advertisements of dressmakers, for example, who sold dresses, quote, in the colors. And you know they didn't have to say these were su suffrage colors. In the colors was sufficient to the, uh, uh, the English uh, public. Uh, it was colors associated with you know, militancy. The uh, button to the right of that, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, was actually the largest suffrage society in all of England, larger than the WSPU, but because they considered themselves to be, quote, law-abiding suffragists, they did not get the press that the WSPU did. And their colors, green, white, and uh, red, were nice, but they just did not have that, the resonance or the response that the purple, green, and white of the uh, uh, WSPU had. Now, buttons were not just something that were handed out. You can read in all of the journals, both in England and America, wear your button, wear your button, wear your button. And why did you wear your button? You wore your button uh, because you wanted to, first of all, show how ubiquitous you know, the movement was. But secondly, you also wanted to engage people in conversation. So in other words, if they saw the button, they might ask, what is it? And then, you know, you, uh, as a, uh, a suffragist, you would go on and, and, and tell them. All right, so I would say that the focus on color was English, although Americans probably produced buttons maybe a year or so earlier than the, than the English. Now, here are some American buttons. And if you'll notice the colors here, First of all, uh, in the top row to the right, the picture of the donkey, Votes for Women plank, that was put out by the Connecticut uh, Women's Suffrage Association. The Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association was one of the oldest associations in the United States. It was started by a woman called Isabel Beecher Hooker. And you may know Isabel Beecher Hooker more by her famous sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, for a long time, the CWSA did very little until at the beginning of the 20th century, some young Turks took over. And one of these young Turks was a woman named Catherine Houghton Hepburn. Now, Catherine Houghton Hepburn, uh, you certainly know her by her more famous daughter, Cath Catherine Hepburn. And now you know, having seen some of her movies with uh, Spencer Tracy and Humphrey Bogart, where she got her feistiness from. 
Uh, the one to the left, the woman blowing the clarion, again, you see purple, green, and white. These colors are no accident. These organizations were definitely, definitely trying to tie into the militancy of the English movement. Now, they didn't engage in any kind of the destructive behavior that the English suffragists did, but they tried to push the envelope you know, a, a little bit more. Uh, the one in the center is a ribbon, the Women's Party. This is the famous uh, Alice Paul's Women's Party. And uh, uh, scholars today are at odds as to who was more influential finally in 1920 of getting the vote for women. Was it the Women's Party? Uh, led by Alice Paul, or was at the National American Women's Suffrage Association at that time, headed by Carrie Chapman Catt. Uh, below that, to the right, uh, votes for women. This is the most common pin that you will find today. It, uh, it was produced in the millions. I have seen you know, a number of figures. Now, what I don't quite understand is why the colors that the uh, National American Women Suffrage Association used were always, on their buttons, gold, because they had a connection to yellow, which probably is the most commonly used color associated with the uh, uh, suffrage movement. To the left of that, anti-suffrage, there were some anti-suffrage buttons produced. And uh, in terms of color, they themselves had their own color scheme, which is basically red. Red and rose, and I'll show you later on a picture of a, a piece of sheet music done by a, a, a man uh, affiliated with the Massachusetts Anti-Suffrage Association. The title of the music is my anti-suffrage rose. And there's a nice, you know, uh, rose on, on, on the front cover. And he's basically the lyrics are about what a nice old fashioned girl, you know, he's uh, involved with not one of them kind uh, kinds of women. All right, now I promise to have some sort of connection here or some talk about Rhode Island contributions. And as I said, they were very few. The American Women's Suffrage Party is basically a New York City organization. Uh, they did have a branch working in Rhode Island. To date, I have not come across or seen a single suffrage button that is Rhode Island specific. I imagine if the uh, WSP did have a branch in Rhode Island, if they used any buttons at all, they would have borrowed them from the New York campaign. Uh, the one in the upper left is a controversial button, suffrage first. It's a phrase that was used by both the moderates, i.e. Carrie Chapman Catt, used by the moderates, and also the more militant or radical uh, out of the Alice Paul group. With Carrie Chapman Catt, it simply meant that Women were always volunteering to do this, to do, do that, to do that. And she said, came out with this button, it is the responsibility of women to ensure the fact that they get the right to vote first before they do anything else. Now, later on, it became, as I said, controversial when Alice Paul also used the phrase. But Alice Paul, who was a peacenik, uh, who was responsible for the uh, uh, picketing of the White House. This is during wartime. And basically, be, you know, America uh, suffrage first. Uh, let's not worry about the war. Our effort should be on getting women the right to vote. And that was one of the things that she did that uh, a lot of people considered to be rather unpatriotic. She was good, though, and she was highly, highly successful in, uh, in helping women to achieve the right to vote. All right, I talked about uh, postcards. I will be doing a little bit about postcards. It's because I think their uh, postcards, probably among the suffragists, were the most frequently purchased and used of all suffrage memorabilia. I don't know how many suffrage cards ultimately exist, uh, in my own collection, I have 2,300. 
uh, and that includes both English and America. And I noticed that one of the things that scholars now, suffered scholars are very, very interested in are the postcards more than the buttons. And the reason for that is, as you can see, the images here, uh, these images reflect the average American's attitude pro and against suffrage. The uh, buttons here, uh, excuse me, the postcards here that I say commercial cards, sets, these were all issued in sets. They were all commercial, most commercial cards, not all of them, most uh, commercial cards were anti-suffrage in intent, in but they were, not, they were a little bit softer than their English counterparts, which could get quite vicious. Uh, in a couple of the English uh, cards, you see cartoons of suffragists being force-fed uh, in Holloway, and this is done in a comic, comic way. The uh, uh, one to the far right, Mother's Got the Habit now. This was, I think, part of anti-suffrage propaganda at the time. You give women the right to vote and what's gonna happen? Roles in society are going to be reversed. And women are gonna go out, they're gonna be smoking as this woman here is smoking a cigar. They're gonna be going you know, to, to bars and men are gonna be staying home, minding the baby, washing the dishes and cleaning the floors. And Professor McIntyre, stop laughing. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the postcard to the far left, a, a, as you can see, gender switching. And it, it's a Uncle Sam suffrage, uh, the female uh, element taking over from the patriotic uh, male. The one in the center, I may be your leader someday. I gave a talk a couple of years ago at uh, the Susan B. Anthony House in Rochester. And I, get, I had a bunch of cards. I said, take one, take a, uh, this is the one they wanted. And they had a uh, Susan B. Anthony celebration over the weekend and they reproduced this card on a cardboard poster and sold it for 10 bucks. And they had a huge stack. By the end of the uh, conference, they're all gone. And th this is just a, an exceedingly popular image even today. You can get it on a keychain. All right, now these are the official cards. And by official cards, I mean these were the ones that were produced by the actual organizations themselves. They're not commercial, although certainly women's organizations did sell them. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on them. Uh, the uh, card in the far right, the spirit of 76, is you know, done after the famous painting, done by uh, Rose O'Neill, uh, who was very famous for her Cupid dolls. And Rose O'Neill was a ardent suffragist, and she produced postcards and posters for the movement, uh, among uh, other things. Uh, the one to the left of that card, uh, the Socialist Party. Socialist Party was connected with women's suffrage in the beginning, although at a, they began to part ways after a while. But this is a particularly famous, iconic situation where the man on the left, the drunk at the bar, smoking a cigar, he can vote. The uh, picture of a woman with a baby, she cannot. The, this kind of appeal at, at times can get racist. And there are cards that will, and I'll, I'll use the, the terminology from the cards themselves. They'll picture the Chinaman, uh, the idiot, they mean, you know, men mental idiot, the uh, mentally unbalanced as opposed to, uh, to the idiot, uh, and, and, and the black, the black man. They could vote, but the woman could not. All right. Uh, real photo uh, cards, and then I'll maybe move on to something else. Real photo cards was something that were very popular at the uh, turn of the century on for the next maybe 15, 20 years. And what it was, it was a process by which you could take a picture and have, when people took pictures uh, 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 and had a camera as opposed to an iPhone, uh, you, you developed your film, but instead of developing it on photographic paper, you could have it developed directly on a postcard. 
And so this meant that, you know, you did not have to, if you wanted a postcard, you didn't have to go to a commercial publisher and go to the expense of having something commercially published, but rather, you know, you could send in a, a negative and have, you know, one, two, 10, 20 copies done. Uh, these are of some note because, let's see, uh, I was told, okay. These are of some note. Uh, the, uh, uh, the women here, uh, Nell Richardson and a uh, Alice Snitcher Burke, they, to, again, talking about visual rhetoric, they went on a cross-country tour in a car called the Golden Saxon that had been donated to the cause. And this was quite daring, you know, for women to drive across country. And as I, actually, in this time period, not too many women could drive. And often you, you, you see photographs of floats in a, a parade. And it's a women's suffrage, women float but you have a male driver. Uh, as late as 1888, Grover Cleveland, the Democratic president, forbade his wife from even riding a bicycle. Well, the whole idea, you stand on a bicycle and your skirt has to go up. To the right of that is a picture of uh, Inez Milholland, who was the martyr of the movement. She was always in poor health. She suffered from pernicious anemia. And uh, Alice Paul sent her to California uh, uh, to help with the movement out there. While she was there, she just weakened and died. So uh, the idea, you know, she died for the cause. To the bottom left, uh, picketing of the White House, it's interesting because of all of the suffrage events that occurred, you cannot find too many images, either real photo or regular photo cards of the, uh, the demonstration before the White House. So plenty of pictures available, but just not all that many on postcards. To the right of that is a woman on horseback. And this was the famous March 3rd, 1913 March on Washington by far the largest suffrage demonstration ever held. And it was purposely held the day before Wilson's uh, Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. So many people attended that when Wilson on March 3rd got off the railroad train to take him into Washington DC for his inaugural parade the next day, that where are the people? Where's all the people? Uh, they're supposed to come and greet me. Where are they? And then he was told, you know, they were at the suffrage uh, uh, parade. Uh, but the other thing about uh, this is that the woman that you see front and center is a woman called, well, she would have called herself Mrs. Richard Coke Burleson. You know, her uh, uh, birth name is May Walker. But for obvious reasons, I will refer to her as Mrs. Richard Coke Burleson because she was damn well determined to be Richard Coke Burleson's husband, uh, wife rather, even though she hated his guts. Uh, that was not a marriage made in heaven. Uh, Coke Burleson was a military man. He went all over the globe. Uh, she did not spend all that much time with him. She would go off for months at a time and stay with her mother in Texas, where she came from. Uh, the other thing is she became very, very interested in archaeology and would spend several months down in South America going through ruins, digging, you know, helping uh, to dig them up. In the meantime, her husband, besides spending a lot of time on military uh, matters, the rest of his time he spent on securing mistresses. And he apparently had, you know, one serious relationship after another, which he knew about. And finally, he said, I, I don't want this woman anymore. I want to divorce her. She refused a divorce, and she fought like hell to keep him, even though it's apparent that she had absolutely no affection whatsoever uh, 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 towards him. So finally, after a series of protracted uh, uh, debates in court, they did get divorced in 1937. He remarried his current mistress, excuse me, he married his current mistress. In 1940, uh, his second wife was having tea 
at a, a hotel in South Carolina. She came into the room where she was with a handbag. From her handbag, she took uh, out a tiny handgun and shot her twice and killed her. Uh, she was obviously arrested, taken to court, jury trial. Uh, the jury trial sentenced her to eight years in prison. She went to prison. Uh, she, uh, when she was let out, she apparently then went back to Texas and very little was heard of her uh, since then. All right, now we get into uh, some Rhode Island stuff. And this is something that I've always been very, very interested in. June 8th and 9th, 1914, was something called the Great, the Conference of Great Women. And it was held at Alva Belmont's Newport, Rhode Island estate. And all of the guests who paid money to attend this conference were served lunch on China. And this is the actual China that was used at that you know, conference. My, I am intrigued by this because I don't know how many uh, pieces in this design were ultimately produced. I suspect uh, only five uh, or five or six. And I have some other pieces and I, I think they came from New York and I'll get into that in just a second. But you, you have a bread plate, you have a, uh, uh, a luncheon plate, you have a cup and a saucer, and you have a soup bowl. You have a berry bowl, and I'm not sure that that was part of the uh, uh, conference China. I did write to Newport and ask them about this, and uh, I wanted to know how many pieces were produced, et cetera, and how many different types. And they wrote back and said, uh, unfortunately, we can't tell you because all the records were destroyed in a fire in 1935. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to guess and maybe do a little bit more research into contemporary newspapers at, uh, of the time. Now, the other uh, use for this China is Alva Belmont was also the head of the Political Equality Association, and which it was uh, a New York City kind of thing. The one thing that she did, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but she had a luncheon place where working women could come in and have lunch. Uh, there was also a beauty parlor upstairs, which I will talk about, as I said, a little bit more later on. And the, the, this creamer or milk jug that you see there, that I know was sold at the headquarters for 25 cents a piece. Now, how much of the other uh, material was sold at uh, there, I have no idea. The pieces at the bottom, I just found out what they were made for. They say Political Equality Association. There's a five cent, there's a 10 cents, and a 25 cents. Very rare, but what the heck were these, you know, made for? And then I came across a newspaper article. Apparently, when you went in and got lunch, you didn't pay in cash for your lunch, but the rather it was almost like a uh, buffet kind of thing where you paid as you went. And what you did as you walked in the door, you bought a bunch of these tokens. And then as you picked out you know, various kinds of food, then you, you, you would just give them uh, uh, the tokens. So, okay. Uh, real photo cards. I was telling you about uh, the Conference of Great Women where uh, the, uh, the China was used. These are pictures from the Conference of Great Women. Uh, the lower picture there is of uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Maud Ballington Booth. Uh, Ballington Booth was the son of Edwin Booth, the uh, founder of the uh, uh, Salvation Army. To the left, top left, is Consuela Belmont, the Duchess of Marlborough. Now, here's an interesting story. If you go to Newport, they'll tell you all about it. She didn't want to marry the, Dutch, uh, the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, his, her mother was insistent on it. And it was one of those kinds of marriages. Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Downton Abbey, you know, where you have the rich American woman married to the impoverished uh, 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 nobleman who nevertheless has a title. 
So Mrs. Belmont wanted that title. So she forced her daughter into marriage. Daughter didn't want to get married. So uh, uh, Mrs. Belmont uh, had a, quote, heart attack and said, you have brought me on so much grief. So Consuela finally you know, uh, let in. The problem with this marriage was that unlike the Downton uh, Abbey marriage, this was not successful at all. And I don't know what their marriage bed was like, but apparently it was occupied by almost every single noblewoman in England apart from Consuela Belmont. So she finally divorced him and came home. Uh, Rhode Island cards. These are cards that, interestingly enough, most of them are connected, or uh, all of them, to uh, Sarah Algio. Remember the, uh, the uh, book that I showed? Uh, my wife is telling me, how many minutes do I have? All right, all right. Uh, so I won't say much about that. Albert B. Love. The, uh, when Belva Lockwood, who was the second woman to run for president, she needed a vice president, so she selected Albert B. Love, and you know, a lot of publicity uh, uh, came out about this. The problem is she never consulted Albert B. Love in the first place. And Albert B. Love, who was the founder of the Universal Peace Union, wrote to Alva Belmont saying, thank you for the honor. I consider you to be a great friend, but you have to realize I'm an anarchist. <laughs> and uh, an anarchist cannot run for office. You know, it's a contradiction in terms. Uh, but uh, th now this is a newspaper, and it's the uh, 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 presidency campaign uh, edition, and it's, it was published. This is one of the versions that was published in Pawtucket, uh, and their word didn't get out quickly enough that Albert B. Love was not her vice presidential candidate. A man called Charles B. Wells was, but uh, uh, there, there you have the there you have the supposed ticket. This is some more uh, Rhode Island paper, and I will move on very, very quickly. The sashes that you see Professor McIntyre and Professor Stern wearing, uh, they, uh, those are pictures of the, the ones, the actual ones that they were wearing uh, today. I was very interested to see uh, uh, Professor McIntyre had first choice. His, uh, uh, Professor Stern was not in the room at that point, and she immediately grabbed the you know the purple, green, and white, which, which told me you know she must be a rather militant you know kind of person. And I I was talking to her students earlier today, and I I warned them you know be careful, don't cross her. Whatever you do, don't cross her. Uh, votes for women, uh, the umbrella. Uh, this was not a practical thing to keep the rain off, but rather it was something to be used in parades. And the word Idaho is actually, um, I shouldn't have that. Uh, the word Idaho is, uh, uh, was handwritten on, on this. You could purchase these, by the way, for at, at that time, uh, $1.25. Magazine covers, I love these. Magazines went, the early magazines were totally, totally, totally anti-suffrage. But then when you get more into the 20th century, a lot of the traditional magazines, which were male-oriented, were losing money. So magazines had to appeal now to women. And once they did, they couldn't be hostile to women anymore. Uh, so you have Life magazine, which was the People magazine or Us uh, at, at the time, they came out with a bunch of really famous covers. The one of uh, which pictures five people there, it says four voters. And again, you can see the racism, the uh, anti-immigration thing, four voters. Who are the four vo uh, voters? A black person, a drunken laborer, uh, presumably a confidence man, to the right is a member of an organization called the Black Hand, which uh, was a uh, predecessor to the Mafia. I love the one at the bottom, Work to Win. It was a boys magazine. And uh, the hero of this, and if I can only get the, uh, uh, the hero of this was Fred Fearnot, and Fred Fearnot, this oligarchical named person, he was in all of the uh, uh, stuff. Now, uh, this particular issue, Fred Fearnot in debate 
okay, the, the warmest member of the house. And he is quoted on the front page of saying that he has a mother, a sister, uh, a, a friend's sister, and he would do anything in the world uh, for their comfort, including the laying down of his life, Fred Fear Not. But I'm opposed to their becoming voters. So I'll die for them, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let them have the right to vote. Uh, all right. that's, that's what women were facing. Appleton's Journal, uh, this from the 1860s, very famous journal at the time, mother and child anti-suffrage message. Okay. Uh, why am I? Okay. Ribbons, Nye uh, Penance. I, uh, my wife tells me I probably only have about five minutes to... What? I'm fine. Okay. I'm going to show you, just show you how to make the screen back to the normal uh, projection side. But maybe you can just give them a hand. See how you. you oh, oh I, I see. I did something that I shouldn't have done. How, uh, okay. All right. Uh, penance. These are generally, you know, worn, uh, not worn, but, you know, carried during uh, parades. Sometimes they were actually even worn like sashes. The anti-suffrage piece in the upper right uh, is from New York. The uh, anti-suffrage people just did not have the money that the pro-suffrage people did. And so you don't find all that many anti-suffrage artifacts, plus the fact that while you certainly did have anti-suffrage demonstrations, they did not attract nearly the number of pro-suffrage uh, people. The uh, votes for women to the left, you've seen that image before on a button that I first showed you. You'll notice on the banner, there are a number of stars. I don't, I'll, I'd have to count if there are 11 or 12. As most of you know, women in certain states had certain limit, limited rights to vote. And prior to the passage of the suffrage amendment in 1920, uh, I would say about 15, 14, 15 states actually gave women full voting rights. And the iconography of this whole thing is that at least in the beginning, when a new state was added to the suffrage column, they would come out with new materials. So a button, for example, might have five stars on it, and then California joins the ranks, so they add a six star, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it got to the point, uh, I would say, after California, new states came on so rapidly that it became a real, real expense because, you know, you couldn't, uh, you would produce one button and then, you know, the next day another state was added to the column. So uh, 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 you had an economic uh, uh, thing there. I would have to count the number of stars to tell you exactly what year this is, this is from. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Sheet music. I we spoke earlier about the anti-suffrage rows. You know, here you can see the copy of the actual uh, magazine, uh, sheet music. Uh, American citizens who cannot vote. Let me read this. The Indian, the Chinaman, the idiot, and the woman. So that's not quite a message that I think if women wanted to get the vote uh, today, they, they would uh, uh, go forth with. She's good enough to be your baby's mother. She's good enough to vote with you. There are different aspects of the suffrage movement. Uh, there were the militants. Uh, there were you know, the new women. There were the, uh, the traditional women who wanted the vote. And the whole idea, of course, is that uh, it was men who were in the position of power to grant women the vote. And you had to be careful, at least with a lot of men, you couldn't suggest that this was part of a movement 
you know, where women were going to transform themselves. Rather, you wanted to say that uh, women deserve the vote, but it's a traditional woman. It's your baby's mother, your wife, or your own mother. And these are not women who are uh, uh, in the new fashions or anything like that. They're the old fashions, the old fashioned kind of people. Don't worry, guys, it's going to be okay. The March of the Women, uh, this, is, uh, this march is English, and the uh, composer, Ethel Smythe, very interesting. She wrote this. This has became pretty much, you know, the standard anthem in England. Smythe was, or Smith, was arrested for her anti-suffrage activities. And while in her cell, she heard some women in the courtyard walking around, humming, singing her march. So she was so excited by this. You know, she was the conductress. So what she did was she grabbed her toothbrush and from her cell, through the bars, she, she conducted. All right, uh, trade cards. Uh, let me just move on quickly. One is I understand from uh, Professor McIntyre that some of her students were very interested in the bird. The bird, this is from 1915. There were four states that had referenda in that year. There was uh, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, and uh, uh, New York. And the idea was, if you can get one of those states, that would be a powerful message to send to have a national uh, constitutional amendment. So all kinds of creative things were done in campaigns in all four states, including Massachusetts, where this bird comes from, which was nailed to fence posts and telephone poles and things like that. There's a little hole that you might be able to see uh, around the letter F. Uh, unfortunately, in none of those states did uh, this win. The uh, Votes for Women face powder uh, I was telling uh, Professor McIntyre's class earlier today that I once got a phone call from the Revlon people, who uh, cosmetics, who wanted to, were in the process of doing a, a, a museum. And they really wanted to link their products up with the suffrage movement. And somehow, you know, the liberated woman, the woman who gets the vote wants to wear a lipstick, uh, you know, that sort of thing, which was... I told him, I said, I had my doubts about that. The one item that we have here is the face powder, but this is not, I think, the kind of thing that Revlon was focusing. Uh, souvenir of suffrage, uh, Sarah's suffrage victory. Sarah Badgley was not a suffragist, but uh, in 1848, she came from Canada to work in the mills in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, she, organized women there, fought very hard for a 10-hour day, uh, became a telegraph operator, went back to the mills, and then finally her, uh, her father was very ill, and so she left never to be heard of again. So she was not a, uh, involved in the suffrage uh, movement, but certainly in terms of women's rights, she was right up there. But this was sold. Uh, and, you know, you, you would sell the thread holder, you know, you put the uh, uh, spools of thread in the holder and you see those little openings and you uh, take out the different uh, color thread. Uh, again, it was sold as a fundraiser. All right. Uh, playing cards. The one to the top left is English. The, the ones to the right uh, are American. Uh, women's Political Union and the uh, uh, Women's Suffrage Party. The women, some women were very conservative and did not like smoking, did not like drinking, did not like gambling. So these cards were very popular, but the idea was, well, you, you could buy them, I'll sell them to you, but you can only use them for bridge and not for gambling purposes. All right. These are a variety of uh, objects. The paper mache egg, in the, uh, I know of only one example of this. The cat in the upper left, I want my vote, was extremely popular. The dog, 
uh, it's mate was not quite as popular. And I found many examples of the cat sold in the United States or, you know, antique dealers in the United States. The dog, I suspect, had limited appearance in America, but it was sold in, in, in England. The teacup above is English, and it has the portcullis symbol. The, uh, the arrow, that was a symbol that was uh, uh, sewn onto all of the female prisoners in Holloway. Uh, the bottom is also English, soap, glycerin soap. I don't think the holder that it comes in was original with, with the soap. Actually, there were several varieties of, of soap. And fortunately, fortunately, the uh, person who purchased this must have been pretty dirty and uh, uh, never washed uh, his or her hands. Uh, so this thing remains intact. Women's ballot box. Women were allowed in at least 20 states the right to vote, but not for any significant audience, uh, uh, office. They could vote not for president, not for mayor, not for governor, but they could uh, sometimes certain municipal elections such as school board. And the idea basically was to uh, shut them up. You know, one of uh, women's uh, uh, arguments for the right to vote well, you want us to be the guardian of your children. Therefore, we need the right to vote to make sure that the right policies are in place. So some states said, okay, you want that, you got it. You can vote for the school board. Uh, now, but he, now here's the problem. You are male, patriarchal, and you grudgingly allow women to vote for school board. But the one thing you don't want them to do, and you know they're gonna do it, and they would, to be quite frank, you don't want them to vote for president. Well, how can you keep them from going to the ballot box and sneaking in a presidential ballot or a gubernatorial ballot, you know, with their uh, vote for school board? Well, what you do is you simply segregate the ballot boxes. So you have a ballot box for men and a ballot box for women. So when you open up and count the ballots here, yeah, if you find a vote for president in this particular ballot box, you throw it out. You know, maybe a woman could have uh, done the symbolic gesture of voting for president, but it wouldn't count. Hunger strike medal. This is English. As you know, women went on hunger strikes. To honor them, the WSPU in England made a hunger strike medal and gave it to women coming out of prison. On the front side, it says hunger strike. On the back side is engraved the actual name of the uh, hunger striker. And to the left, you can't read this, but it says Lavender Guthrie, and then it says something about her. Uh, so they got them in these presentation boxes. If they were ever, ever brought back to prison and went on another hunger strike, uh, they got a, an additional bar that they could add to, the, uh, to, to this ribbon. When I purchased this, I was a little bit disappointed because I couldn't find out anything at all about Lavender Guthrie. She was just not one of the uh, major suffrage figures in England. But, and this is where I say but, since then a lot of information has come uh, out about her. And if you ever want to do a, if any of you are scholars and you want to do a wonderful, wonderful article, you can do something about her life. Now what happened is after she got out of prison, she pretty much dropped out of the movement. To support herself, she became an, uh, an actress, changed her name to Laura Gray, and there were some rumors, true or false, I have no idea, uh, that she also uh, became a prostitute to uh, supplement her income. One day, the police came to her flat. Uh, she had committed suicide. Uh, she was depressed. She committed suicide. The police chief came and a friend of mine sent me uh, a copy of the original newspaper article. This medal that you see, this specific medal, was written up in the newspaper. The chief of police at the time came into her flat, saw uh, the medal, and said, this is what caused her to commit suicide. And everybody said, what do you mean? 
How, do, how, how does a metal, uh, you know, cause a person to commit suicide? And the answer was, well, you, simply, she was involved in the suffrage movement. It addled her brain. And, you know, had it not been for the suffrage movement itself, you know, she would have been a fine, upstanding woman. All right. Now, this is the last uh, thing I have. I, uh, I can go over uh, some other stuff. I just want to, okay. Uh, uh, the crisis. There is more and more scholarship being done today to try to go into black women's contribution to the suffrage movement. It's a highly controversial subject today. In terms of memorabilia, you can find very little. That doesn't mean that women weren't, uh, black women weren't uh, active. It simply means that they did not have the money or were, were with all to create memorabilia. The crisis, it started in 1910. Many of you know the crisis as this was the official organ of the NAACP, started up by the uh, activist W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, to the lower left is Sojourner Truth. Uh, to the uh, uh, standing above her, of course, is Abraham Lincoln. It's an iconic image that I have seen on badges, but I have never seen the words votes for women on the badge. And this, to my knowledge, even though this magazine is rare, is about as uh, extensive or uh, probably the most famous article produced by African Americans that relate to so, uh, to relate to the suffrage movement on the inside there is two page forum of black leaders all male who uh, advocate support for women's suffrage I think at this point uh, Katie I'd better stop and if there are any questions I'd be more than delighted to Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Flory, for this um, that wonderful question you given us about the female. Students in my suffrage class wanted to know, in terms of toys, you talked about and you've written about how they weren't really designed for kids, but really marketed for adults, toys revolving around the issue of suffrage. What was the suffrage world in you? Um, was that a popular one? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there were uh, a couple of varieties of it. And from what I understand uh, from newspaper accounts is that they were bought up by men, not specifically to give to their children. Do you all know what a whirligig is? That's one of those things. It's a, a metal spiral, and you have a, a tin object and you move the object up the spiral, and then you let it go, and then it whirls around until it goes all, all the way down. Uh, when I was a kid, there were whirly gigs. I don't think they're, they're around anymore. That's why I asked if you, uh, people knew what they were. Uh, the, uh, you'd think there was a would be a whole bunch of manufactured dolls. There are a couple of dolls around, but again, they don't seem primarily to be given out to children. I'm sure that a child somewhere along the line may have gotten a doll, but the fact that these dolls were not mass produced, I think is a rather telling, uh, telling argument. One question, Molly, from Gender and Women's Studies 100. She would like to know what the other colors symbolize on the flag, uh, the women's suffrage flag. You mentioned gold um, is the color of pro-suffrage, but on the National Women's Party, flag or the purple, yellow, white. What were the other colors? National gold. All right, the, the National Women's Party. Uh, Alice Paul, you know, the founder of the National Women's Party, originally, as many of you know, if you've seen the uh, Iron Joyed Angels, the uh, uh, HBO special that deals a lot with Alice Paul. Alice Paul came back from England. She was obviously an American. She was a Quaker, but she learned a lot from the English movement. And when she first came on the scene, she was a member of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. But they were kind of leery about her because she seemed to be a little bit too militant for their tastes. So she got the, uh, the right to run this big parade in Washington. Well, they said, go ahead, but we're only going to give you a paltry sum to run it. Well, uh, that's OK. She raised the money, and she had this huge, huge thing. Uh, she formed something within the National American Women's 
association called uh, the Congressional Union. Uh, so she split in, the, in that same year, 1913, from the uh, NASA, formed the Congressional Union, which eventually evolved into the women, uh, National uh, Women's Party. The colors, as you know, the militant colors are uh, purple, green, and white. The color of uh, NASA semi-officially was yellow. Are, are gold. And I suspect what happened when she first came across this color division, she probably combined the gold from NASA with the uh, purple, green, and white of the, uh, 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 of the English movement, and then carried it on when uh, the National Women's Party was formed. I don't think that Americans in general uh, had quite the connection with color that the English did. Most American uh, 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 organizations were loosely affiliated with NASA. So if they used any color at all, you know, they either used the color NASA or in some cases they used their official state colors. You often find that in New York, the uh, uh, purple, actually not, uh, the uh, blue and orange or blue and blue and yellow. Thank you. One person who shared a question ahead of time wanted to know about audience. Um, wondering how affordable some of these items were, um, how they were marketed or presented, and if you have a sense of what kinds of people were buying them. I think, uh, you know, uh, everybody bought them. And they were cheap. Uh, postcards, especially in, in England, I think one of the reasons why they produced so many postcards was because the average working girl, if she could afford anything, she could afford a penny for a postcard. Uh, the buttons, uh, yes, they were sold. I think uh, the buttons were sold generally for about a nickel a piece, but when you went from four stars to five stars, sometimes the buttons weren't on uh, sale for half price to get rid of, you know, uh, uh, of your backlog. So I would say that much of this was cheap enough for the average woman to, to buy. Uh, they definitely weren't. An umbrella at $1.25 would have been expensive, but on the other hand, I don't think the, you know, the average uh, working girl would be expected to buy a, uh, an umbrella for a parade. One other question. Do you have any sense of when the response of men was to the prevalence of suffrage memorabilia in the marketplace? It sounds like it was absolutely everywhere. It was everywhere. And, you know, you did have male supporters. There is one story, uh, the button that I showed you from the Women's Political Union, the woman blowing the, the trumpet, quite colorful. A man went into the store uh, the WPU uh, store uh, near Wall Street, in, uh, in obviously in, in New York, bought a bunch of buttons. Walked a couple blocks away on a street corner, he auctioned them off. And as he was auctioning them off, there was a tremendous crowd, and they bought this stuff and you know uh, for very high prices. So the man you know then went back to the WPU uh, headquarters, bought everything they had and went back to uh, the same street corner and again auctioned them off and sold every single one of them. Now, to be fair, I mean, he was an, an honest guy. He took all the profits and then went back to the WPU store and gave it to you know, the woman who, so, who sold him the buttons. I, I would say that uh, uh, the memorabilia could cause a hostile reaction I certainly, I mean, there's absolutely no, no question about it. And there, there are, uh, on record, women who participated in marches were, you know, beaten, punched, kicked, uh, yelled at. The women who uh, participated in front of uh, the Silent Sentinel demonstration in front of the White House, they were subject to constant abuse. And we're told by Alice Paul, if somebody abuses you, you stay silent. That's why they're called the silent sentinels. You don't respond. 
and they were punched, their banners were torn from their hands and ripped. Police in general did nothing. Uh, but yeah, there, there were male supporters. Uh, there were uh, uh, sometimes people uh, use them themselves. Uh, there were male organizations. What, there's that book now, it's a couple years old, The Suffragettes uh, of you know, male supporters to, uh, to the movement. So uh, I, I have a story behind that, but that's the that's beside the point. I'd rather uh, hear some of the other questions. Um, we have a YouTube question. You mentioned Rome Sunday being the first Christian event to take place in Rome. Can you name a few more? Were suffrage artists primarily women? Uh, yes, they were. There were some exceptions, though. And one was a man called C.D. Batchelor who won the Pulitzer Prize for cartooning. And I, uh, I have one poster uh, of his. Uh, I, the, some of the magazine covers were done by Harrison Fisher and uh, what's his name? Um, oh, uh, I can't think of it offhand. Uh, but there were several famous male illustrators of uh, magazine covers, again, uh, men. In England, there were two groups. One was called the uh, uh, Suffrage Atelier, and the other was called the uh, 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 Women's Suffrage uh, Artists uh, League. And these were uh, two groups. Women did very little else except to produce uh, suffrage art for the movement. Sylvia Pankhurst, who was the daughter of the most extreme militant in all of England, Emmeline Pankhurst. Uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful artist, and she did a lot of stuff for the uh, uh, WSPU. But uh, were there men? Yes, there, there were. But uh, predominantly, the artists were women. There, uh, the book on this, if you're uh, a person that's really interested in, is a book called Cartooning for Suffrage, which deals a lot with the women artists who are uh, were engaged in this kind of thing. Not the male artists so much, but the, the women artists. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Professor Flory for a really fun and fascinating presentation. And thank you all for tuning in from home. Please join us for the next lecture in our Suffrage Centennial series, October 15th at 7 p.m. with Professor Martha Jones. <laughs>